fabulous. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Maria Bernier. And you know what, Kim? I should have actually changed my name while we were talking about that. Mm -hmm. So I could say that my pronouns are she and her, and that I work at the Connecticut State Library as the state data coordinator and construction grant administrator. And I am here with my coworker, Kim. Hello, friends. My name is Kim Poe. My pronouns are also she, her. I work with the Connecticut State Library, and I am the children and young adult consultant there. And sometimes we talk about our weeding experience so that you guys have a sense of where we're coming from while we're giving this presentation. Most recently, I actually weeded our professional development collection at the Middletown Library Service Center. Uh, and it hadn't been weeded in a really long time. So when, <laughs> when, when you are facing a collection that hasn't been touched in a long time, you have my sympathy. I understand where you're coming from. But I used all of the techniques that we're going to talk about today. So I that was a real thing. Kim was my sounding board for questions that I had. Um, and prior to that, I have kind of overseen staff who were weeding a collection in Newport, large library. They always took every book they were given and never got rid of anything. And so their shelves were jammed. And every time they had to reshelve a book, they had to shift everything on either side to reshelve a book. So that's another sign that you need to weed. And then when I was working at a university library, I got to be a selector for a certain subject and then also got to weed in that area of world history. So I have a experience from a few different libraries. And Kim has also been weeding at work. Yes, yes. Um, I was also re weeding with Maria um, in our professional development collection, a super big project that not only Maria, myself, we pulled in, I think every other consultant that we had at the time and to help do a massive weed of the large print collection that had previously been housed at the old location um, where the library for the blind was before it was moved to the service center in Middletown where we are. I'm currently weeding our nonfiction and picture book uh, selection at the service center. I bounce back and forth so I don't get bo uh, bored, which I don't think we address here, but that's something that can be done just to kind of keep things fresh and interesting. I, uh, in nonfiction, often pulled out books that were older than me. And I'm not saying that I'm super old. I'm just saying that maybe we shouldn't have nonfiction books older than I am. Um, I've also worked at a multitude of public libraries. Um, I've worked in everything from um, an urban library that was a part of a multi-branch system to a rural affluent uh, library to even a bookmobile where we definitely had to weed and be selective um, because the books lived on the on the bus. It was a bus that people came in and out of that moved from location to location. So uh, between Maria and I, we have a wealth of weeding experience for sure. Yeah. So again, just mentioning for anybody who might have joined us after we mentioned it, please go ahead and find your Q&A box. And if you think of something you'd like us to talk about over the next couple of hours, please put it into the Q&A box. We'll keep an eye on that. Also, speaking of two hours, we're going to be here until three o'clock. So Kim and I have iron bladders right now, but you may not. Feel free to walk away, right? Take your bio break as needed. This is being recorded. So if you need to hop back and catch something, you'll be able to get, find the recording tomorrow on our website. And if you just wanted to refresh yourself about something we said, you can find that recording as well. So do what you need to do. If you got to make funny faces or do jumping jacks or whatever, like just um, we'll stay together here for another couple hours. And then I think we are ready to talk. Yeah. Cool. So I am going to start by putting all of our resource sharing initiatives in context for you. Our, our homepage for the Division of Library Development is there, but I want to make sure everybody's fully aware of all of the statewide services that the Division of Library Development and the Connecticut State Library offer starting with the Middletown Library Service Center, where Kim and I physically are located when we go to the office. It's a wonderful collection. It, it, it's a multi-purpose building. So staff, we used to have meetings there and training sessions, but it also houses our shared collections. And as I mentioned, we have a professional development collection that you can borrow from, as well as amazing children's and YA collections, picture books, board books, 
in young adult fiction. And we have discussion sets. So if you're interested in borrowing 12 copies of something, check us out. We have puppets, we have story time kits, we have a variety of things that you can borrow from us. So you don't have to purchase them for your own library. That's the whole point. If you'd like a rotating collection of large print books from the service center, let us know and we can send those to you. So we offer that as an additional kind of supplementary collection that you guys can borrow from at any point. And those usually circulate for three months or so. In addition, we have Deliver It, which is the delivery system, go figure. So those are the vans that are bringing books from one library to a central sorting location and then delivering them back out to public libraries across the state. It's a fabulous system originally designed to support the Borrow It program, Kineticard, and it works every single weekday. There's drivers on the road bringing books and physical items back and forth from libraries um, that are being borrowed and loaned. So that is an amazing resource you can utilize. I also want to mention Research It, which is all of our online databases and electronic resources. So this is a great alternative to hosting an entire print reference division. You can go online to research it, find a lot of great electronic reference books and databases online that are probably more up to date than an old physical reference collection. So that's available to everybody in Connecticut. You can find it at the public libraries, school libraries, everybody's got access to it, the academic libraries as well. So everybody can get in there. Also, we have Find It and Request It, which work together. Find It is our statewide union catalog that libraries can contribute their holdings to. It doesn't get updated all that often right now. They are moving toward more frequent updates, but it is a union catalog. So you can see what libraries probably have an item that you're looking for and find it. And then if your library also participates and requests it, you can actually request that item online, have it sent through Deliver It to your library so that you can check it out to your patron. So that right there is an amazing way to find other items in the state because you don't have to have it in your library. Another option available to Connecticut library card holders is Borrow It. And we've been talking a lot about this uh, program this year. So Borrow It, it means that I can take my hometown library card in my name to any other participating public library in Connecticut, show them my card and check out an item on their shelves. So if I really, really wanna read a book or watch a DVD, and I don't wanna wait for it to come from another library through the delivery system, I can drive myself to that other library, use my library card and check out that item myself. And then when I'm done with it, I can bring it back to my hometown library. They'll send it back to the originating library through Deliver It. So you see how all these pieces work together. All of them saying, you don't have to have every book that's ever published because somebody in the state probably has it and we can get it for you. Also to mention, Find It has some academic libraries, some school library collections in there. The delivery system sometimes goes to academic libraries. So there are um, structures built in there to support multiple kinds of libraries. And finally, I wanna point out that the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped is now located in Middletown, in the Middletown Library Service Center. So the staff and collections are there. And this name is a little misleading. So they offer services to anybody in Connecticut who has low or no vision, but also to anybody who is print disabled. And that's a new expansion of the definition. So anybody who's um, got dyslexia, dysgraphia, or something that prevents them from actually reading text, and anybody who's got some kind of um, physical disability that may prevent them from actually holding a book and turning pages. So Parkinson's, um, arthritis, any, anything that prevents you from being able to read a standard print book can qualify you to use the LBPH services. And that's a fabulous thing where audiobooks get either sent to you through the mail or um, you can download them onto your device just over the internet. So we've got this entire suite of resource sharing options available to support your library 
so that you do not have to be Amazon and have every book ever published. And you don't have to be a storage warehouse storing everything that you have ever acquired. So if you have questions about those, we can always follow up with you afterward, but that's the context that we're working with today. Absolutely. And so in the context of you don't have to be a storage unit, you don't have to be Amazon. Um, we are libraries and we are going for the, the this image as opposed to the not that image. Basically, um, the goal of sort of weeding and what we're hoping to teach you are the basic ideas of quality over quantity. It's not how much you have, it's what you have. Is it discoverable? Is it something that the folks in your community will want and use? Um, sheer number is not always going to help you um, in every situation and sort of books and shelves and what libraries are supposed to be are basically one of those. So Maria and I are going to go over sort of, you know, weeding how to's and the unfortunate thing that we're going to start with here is that there's no one way to do this. There, we're we're weirdly going to give you formulas, but but sort of not all at the same time. And as we sort of make it through the rest of our time here, that is going to become uh, you're, you're going to understand a little bit better what we're talking about. But some of the things that you're definitely going to want to have is a well thought out collection development policy that addresses weeding. So really, we're saying collection development, but uh, I think sort of as a institution, we are moving to uh, collection management. It's not just about the developing, the bringing in, the adding of titles. It's about what happens after you have them and then what happens after they leave your library and why they have to leave your library. So um, as we go through this, think about your collection development or management policy and if it specifically addresses weeding material from your collection. It's important to be well-informed, um, not only about um, sort of the weeding information that we're gonna give you today, but also um, literature, period, right? There, there's a certain um, aspect of the, the literary needs of your community and sort of what's happening nationwide that you have to have some basic knowledge of as you're going through the um, collection management process. So, which leads us to be familiar with books, authors, and other library material. That might be some popular local authors, that might be some popular state authors, um, the New York Times, sort of whatever that's going to look like for your community. This is information that you're going to have to familiarize yourself with. And I see that actually the first question that we have is how to familiarize yourself with new uh, sections that you don't have experience in. Um, while this might sort of seem like the time to, to answer that, I think I'm going to touch base on that at the end. But just know I have seen your question and I'm not ignoring it in this, this part of the presentation. We're talking about being familiar uh, with books. You're also going to need to be familiar with your library's long range plan. You might also call that a five year plan or a strategic plan. Maybe it's three years. We all operate a little bit differently, um, but you need to be familiar with what is in that and what the goals for your library are going forward. Um, typically, the long range or strategic plan also ties into community needs and community interest. And the reason that we say that is that in your strategic plan, let's say, for example, you all as a staff have decided that um, you need to provide more services for the growing multilingual population in your community. Maybe you're a community that has received quite a few Afghan refugees within the last couple of months or years, and your library maybe isn't in the best position that it can be in to provide support to this new member of your community. It's important to know that because that might affect the decisions for what you are buying and bringing into your library. Maybe you're hunting up books in other languages. Maybe you want to create an ESL section or a job reference section or something. Well, unfortunately, a new room isn't just going to sprout up into your library overnight, right? I mean, Hogwarts, our buildings are not. We don't just sort of get to ask for something and receive it. And that means that some things might have to go out in order to make space for um, 
the items that you want to bring into your community. Um, you need to take all of this into account as you are going on your weeding journey. Okay. I got distracted by changing my name. So <laughs> we're, we're here to talk about weeding. And I, I know you guys are probably convinced that you need to weed and you're here just to kind of learn the methodology, but you may need to convince other people about the whys. Why do we need to do this? What's the point? And so I'm going to give you a few slides worth of why that you can bring back to anybody who may be a little skeptical or might need a little more information. As Kim mentioned, we like to talk about the collection management process. So thinking of that as a cycle, right, where you're acquiring items, processing them, getting them on the shelf, people are using them. And then after a while, when people are no longer using them or when their condition merits it, you might discard that item. And maybe you want to replace it with the same item, or maybe you want to replace it with new materials. But it's a cycle, right? So it's always an ongoing life cycle of your collection. And there's that kind of balance, too, between what comes in and what goes out. In a mature library with a mature collection, you probably don't have unlimited space, right? You've got a finite amount of space that you're working with. And there's only so much shifting that you can do on a daily basis. So you do need to sort of maintain a balance and a consistent collection size so that you can get everything in. Weeding will also help you identify some gaps in your collection because you're actually spending time in the stacks, in the collection with your hands physically on it. And you may say, oh my gosh, I had no idea, first of all, that we were so strong in this area, but that we didn't have a whole lot in this other area. So you can really get a better sense of where you might want to shore up your collection while you're spending time in it, which is a great thing because you're paying attention to it, right? Collection management is control and attention. Now, um, think about it as kind of a systematic concept. You're taking things out that are no longer useful because you want to maintain the quality of your collection. Like I said, your library is not Amazon. You don't have to have everything that was ever published, nor are you a storage warehouse to have storing everything, whether it's used or not used. What you actually want to do is provide a collection that is suitable for your community, that is a high quality collection. So think about being proud of your collection that you're presenting to your patrons. While we're here and we're talking about that cycle of acquisition um, and discards. Think also about saving some of your collection management budget to purchase those replacements or to purchase new items to fill in some gaps. So um, those are some initial weeding whys. And then here's kind of the nice statement that you can present to potentially board members or stakeholders where you say, look, we're not being irresponsible. We're not just chucking things out. But this is really part of our public service to borrowers, and that's what libraries do. We provide public service to maintain the best possible collection for our community, whether it's for our community where um, we have an increasing number of multilingual speakers, whether we have an aging community that might need more large print materials, but we want to have the best possible collection for our community and we wanna be proud of it, right? We wanna have people come into our library. We wanna be able to say, oh my gosh, we have the best collection in town and it looks good too, right? Like it, you can actually see it, like it's facing out on the shelves, it's gorgeous display, it's it's a wonderful collection. So so again, remind people we're not, we're not being uh, irresponsible and using tax dollars improperly. We're actually doing our jobs. We are actually making sure that we are part of the collection management cycle. It's a, it's a, it's a loop. You got to keep doing it. So that's a great weeding statement to share with your stakeholders. This is um, a nifty little graphic. And if you're looking at it on a small screen, it's not doing it justice. So I encourage you to visit our LibGuide later on and click on the link and be able to see it larger on a larger screen and zoom in. But it's a nice graphic description of weeding and kind of with an academic and scholarly 
twist to it. So it's great for school libraries and academic libraries. Just saying, look, you know, this is our job. This is what we do. We're actually making more space for people, for patrons, which is what libraries are doing these days, right? We want to bring people into the library. We want to not just be a warehouse for books. We want to be a community hub and a place where people are coming and we're making space for people instead. So some benefits, we talked about the whys. Here are some more whys you might want to do it. You're saving space, right? Like you literally are taking things off the shelf, making space where you may put new things or you may want to redisplay items that you have, but weeding helps to save and create space. It also helps to save time, both for staff who are reshelving and for your patrons who are looking for something because that, now they may be able to find it, right? If you have weeded and things are a little uh, easier on the shelves, maybe you're not using the top row, maybe you're not using the bottom row anymore, they're not standing on their heads. So it's easier to find things and they're saving their time and easier to reshelf. You will also make the collection more appealing because it's gonna look nicer, right? With condition issues, you may pull books that have been loved to death and replace them with brand new ones that are gonna get loved more. You may be able to use that space to do some face out displays or make the collection visually more appealing. And you think conversely, um, how could this increase circulation? But it actually does. Uh, there have been studies and you could probably check your own numbers after you weed, your circulation will likely increase as patrons are able to find what they're looking for in an appealing collection. There's a nice story I heard from a library up in the Northwest corner, a public library that had gone through a, a major weed, really cutting, getting rid of all of the, the old dross, let it go, you know, and really freshening up the collection. And they looked in their public library statistics and looked at their turnover rate and saw that their collection was actually getting checked out more after the weed. So they were circulating more and it was turning over more. So oddly enough, weeding increases circulation. Also, you will enhance your library's reputation because now you have an up-to-date collection, right? So you want to have a current collection that is accurate and reliable. So you wanna make sure that you're pulling off all of the books that say Pluto's still a planet. You wanna make sure that you're providing recent reliable information because we're librarians. People come to us for facts and you need to be able to provide them with facts. Also, as I mentioned, you can keep up with what the collection needs, those gaps. Maybe you wanna fill in something. Maybe you also start to recognize books that need mending or binding. Maybe you can set up um, an ongoing weeding schedule for your kind of shabby and unused items. Maybe you wanna set up another scheduled weeding for specific areas of the collection, but you can keep up with that. And you're getting constant insight, right? On where we're good and where we might wanna shore up things. So more benefits of weeding. And uh, as we mentioned, and as we've said, um, you know, a couple of times already, but we're just gonna kind of kind of keep hammering it in. Uh, weeding should absolutely be a part of your material selection policy. Um, and when, uh, you know, the section on weeding is a part of your material selection or collection management, ultimately, whatever you decide to call it, um, it should address a couple of things. It should address the reasons for and what is involved in the weeding process. We can all, you know, um, imagine and maybe some of us have encountered patrons who sort of see you, I mean, maybe not dumping a bunch of books into the trash can, but maybe, I don't know, or maybe, um, you know, scribbling out um, the barcodes and or pulling property labels, ripping out the first page, however it is that your libra library handles that. And I think we can understand a patron kind of panicking a little bit. Like, why, why are you doing that? Why would you destroy this treasured, you know, beacon of joy that is a book? And if you have all of this stuff already addressed and laid out in your collection management policy, um, which in theory is on your website for people to read and, um, you know, learn about at will, then that can answer some of those questions for them. A lot of the things like what Maria was just mentioning before. It should also address the criteria that you use. We will be going over the crew method, um, which is 
criteria that uh, touches base on almost every part of a library collection since their update. Um, so even if you just uploaded that or pulled some bits and pieces from it, um, people are going to want to know that you're not just throwing away books on a whim, that there is uh, a process behind it. And then the disposal of weeding materials. So what do you do with these books after you've thrown them away? We've got about three or four slides on that at the end of this presentation, so we will be getting there. But make sure that you have identified one, two, or three of those that work best for your library and your community and put that right in the policy. You want that if someone should come to you and ask what's going on, why is it happening, uh, tell me everything, you want to be able to point to uh, portions of your uh, material selection or collection management policy and have that explained to them in the moment so you're not you know, getting jumbled on your words or misspeaking or anything like that. Um, so we also have here, and just, um, I, I think it was implied, but maybe we didn't say it. These slides are actually already on our reading workshop uh, page. Um, all of the blue, as per usual, are hyperlinks that will take you to all of these places that we are referencing. Um, but when you um, are working on your collection management policy or the weeding portion of your policy, if maybe you don't have one in there, we've got a couple examples here. Um, the links are still live and they have some really good suggestions in there. Uh, one of these uh, examples, I cannot remember which one, addresses maybe the language that you are using when you are talking about what it is that we are doing. Um, perhaps you find that the word weeding is a little jarring to some folks. They're thinking about like weeding a garden and sort of like throwing them away into the abyss. Maybe you might find the term uh, deselection more appropriate for your community. You are selecting the items that are coming in and you are deselecting the items that are no longer holding worth for your community. Um, also using this word maintenance that we have been uh, saying throughout this presentation. Maintaining a collection has a certain um, appeal to it just from a linguistic perspective um, and it might be more well received. We understand things like maintaining a car, right? Maintaining a roof, the roof of a house, things have to be replaced updated, we understand what that word means in a way that um, we may not understand some of the other terminology that we use. So these are just some suggestions. Maria is the queen of dropping things into the lib guide. So uh, there that is for you. Yeah, so um, every link that is on our slides is on that lib guide. So, so everything you need from today, you can find on our lib guide quite literally the whole kit and caboodle. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the criteria that you're going to use for weeding. So this is a little bit of, um, you know, what's the process that you use when making these decisions. We're going to talk about the contents. Um, so what types of material might you want to think about for reading? Uh, the formats of materials that you might want to think about for weeding and the use. And when we say use, we mean kind of like the CERC stats. So content, what content do you want to consider for weeding? Things that are out of date or misleading. Um, that's gonna be super old medical textbooks. That's going to be, uh, you know, poor Pluto, we did what we did to it, but now it's science and you don't want old information confusing, you know, a well-meaning third grader. Um, so that old, out of date, no longer accurate material, um, you're going to want to uh, pull things that are maybe superseded by a new edition. Um, so that might be with regards to nonfiction, maybe an updated version. So like version seven, as opposed to version five of some academic or nonfiction material. It could even go for fiction books that are reprinted. Um, back in my day, I'm not that old, but like life is changing mighty quickly. Back in my day, uh, you know, the Animorph books that we read, that series has now been repurposed into graphic novels. Babysitter's Club, you know, maybe kids don't want to read those with their old covers. Maybe they want the new Raina Telegemeyer graphic novel version, right? So um, something, something that just sort of has a newer version. 
outdated bestsellers, books that have kind of outlived their popularity. Um, so, you know, maybe that's, um, uh, maybe people aren't reading Twilight as much as they used to be. <laughs> it had its run. Twilight had its run. We were all there. We're done. We've moved on to Vampire Diaries or something. I don't know where we're at, but we've moved past it, right? Um, so maybe, maybe that's one of the ones that you want to get rid of because you know through the resources that the Connecticut State Library offers that the closest five libraries all have three type, three copies. You're a small library. It's a small section. You just can't hold it. These are the decisions that you're going to have to make. With regards to the format of a book, um, are the pages, you know, torn and ripped? Is the spine so broken that pages are beginning to fall out? Uh, did someone temporarily forget that this was not their book and they highlighted some pages and sort of, you know, scribbled down some notes in the side? We all know what those books look like. Yellow pages, warped cover. We know those books when we see them. And sometimes uh, I see this particularly with us, us children's folks and our beloved picture books. We do this and we need to stop. I once had a, uh, for you children's people, you probably know the author Karma Wilson, Bear Sees Colors, Bear Sees Shapes, Bear Sees a lot of stuff. And a young child and their caregiver came to me with one of those books and every single page in that book had been book taped. Not one or two pages, every single page had been taped back into the spine of this book. That meant that Karma Wilson was well-loved. That means that our community was well-received uh, uh, Karma and Bear's lessons very well, but it was time to get a new book. It's time to get a new book. That one needed to go. Um, these are the types of things that you have to pay attention to, which tie back to Maria's statement earlier, and maybe setting aside a little piece of your budget, not for new titles, but for replacing those that have been well loved. Um, and then we have at the end books that have been quote unquote edited by patrons. Um, we might be seeing a lot of this right now. Um, and those might also be some books that you want to think about replacing if you think that they are valid to your community. But we have to keep an eye on these things. And it just does not look good for us when those things are still sitting on the shelves. Um, like we would have pride in giving them to someone because we wouldn't. And then the last thing to think about is circulation use. Um, approximately 50% of the circulation of a title happens within the first five years. So if within the first five years of a, of a book, um, you know, it's only gone out once or twice, it's not, it's probably not gonna go anymore, right? No matter how much we love it. Um, at that five-year mark, that might be the time to start looking at those books that are older than five years old and really deciding if they should remain in your collection. Um, you're going to want to check the last circulation date of these titles and consider weeding items that haven't served in the last three to five years. It's going to depend on um, a couple of things that we're going to dive into a little bit, a little bit later. By a little bit later, I think I mean basically right now. Um, so we are referencing the CRU manual quite a bit. And CRU stands for Continuous Review Evaluation Weeding. Uh, the manual was put together by the Texas State Libra Library and Archives Commission. Um, and they have a newer version that came out in 2012. In the CRU manual, they give us this really awesome acronym that can really help us easily spot and decide what books might we, uh, that we might wanna pull from our collection. And that acronym is MUSTY. Um, M means misleading or inaccurate, something that we talked about a little earlier. Um, if you've got a book that says the uh, world is flat, might be time to let that go. Um, if it's ugly, worn, um, or I know we, we said beyond mending or biting, but if it is, if it's too mended, if there's too much mending that has happened, it needs to go. If it's superseded by a newer, better work and something to consider is maybe that newer or better work is digital, right? Maybe it's something that, that is available through, um, through research it. If it is trivial, um, if it just no one cares anymore, if we've kind of moved on and, and we've let that go, um, that might be that might be 
whatever, what man, what was that? Twilight, that might be something else, right? Where we, where we just don't care anymore. Um, if it's irrelevant to the needs or interests of your community, our communities are constantly changing. Um, maybe at one point you had um, a community full of older folk, and now you have a community full of young parents, right? So the needs and the titles that you're going to want to have more of in your collection might shift. So that's where it's important to know your collection, long range plan, and things like that. And also if the information can be found somewhere else. Maybe that's research it, maybe that's using the deliberate system, um, maybe that's using find it or request it. If you are pressed for space, if you, uh, if you cannot accurately hold and house this information, let it go. This is the third smallest state in the country. We are lucky to be able to have a service like deliver it. We're so used to it that maybe we don't realize that a ton of states do not have this. They do not have the ability to do this as easily as we do. We're not Amazon. It's okay. To also, I forgot to mention there's 190, 190 public libraries in our tiny little state. And many of them, most of them are contributing to the delivery system. Most of them are participating in the borrow it program. So there's literally a library within rock throwing distance of where most people live. So we are super lucky in Connecticut to have all of those resources available to all of us. Imagine if we were in Montana. Here, That's a big old state and I don't think there's a whole lot of stuff there or a Dakota, you know? I mean, like we're really lucky. I know people who work there, they're all really great. I just mean, you know, size and capacity, size, size and sharing, size distance, and sharing. Distance makes yeah. it harder. Yeah, yeah, it does and take longer. Um, so we have a cute little quote here um, that, again, we, we don't need to read the whole thing. It's, it's here for you to kind of read it at will. Um, but basically, you know, like, oh, I can't believe you're throwing out books, a patron, a, a, someone well-meaning, even quite frankly, even like board members and things who, who just don't realize. Um, and basically, they, they are books. They're not gold. They're not diamonds. It's not like... The solution to world hunger, right? Like it's not a, a a genie in a bottle. Like it's a it's a book, and it's gonna be okay. We're we're allowed. We're allowed to to let them go and move on. So now, at the beginning of this presentation, one of the first things I said is that there is no formula for doing this, and it's a little bit of a lie because there is a formula ish. There are for, there are a, a couple of formulas, uh, but we're gonna break this down. So if you have um, a copy of the crew manual, if you printed it or if you have it open and you're kind of referencing it, on page 105, there is a, a large chart. Um, and that chart gives you formulas that look similar to the ones that you see on the screen here. And the way they break down, um, the first uh, space before the slash mark is age. The second space, that space in the middle is circulation. And that last space is where it wants you to take musty into consideration. We're going to go through this, but in the video that we're going to be showing you at the end of our presentation today, it's going to, and by it, I mean, it's me, it's recording of me, um, is going to be showing you how to use this formula and uh, evaluate your collection. So an example, uh, 610, right? So the 610, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're using Dewey, that's like the medicine section. And the formula that the crew manual gives you for the 610s of your collection are five, three, and musty. So if the book is over five years old, if it has less than, if it has three circs or less, and if it falls into that musty category, if it's damaged, if it's been edited, um, it's time for it to go. Um, but uh, you also might see things like the second formula, the, o the OOs, as I call them, OO4s, is the computer section. And you're going to see a different formula. You're going to see three, X, and musty. So three means if it's over three years old. X, no one cares how, how many times it's circed. If it is circulated, whatever, 15 times, it does not matter. Technology changes too rapidly. Anything over three years old is out of date. If you still have books in your 004 on Windows XP, please go get it right now. 
go get it right now and get rid of it. Um, those are examples of the types of formulas that you're going to see on that page. Um, and the thing about the crew manual is that it's been broken down um, into a variety of sections, right? So that's where you get these formulas from. Um, and basically just sort of what the rest of this is saying is there are certain um, books and there are certain subjects and topics that change so quickly, you're going to want to get rid of them in as few as two years. And for example, well, let's just say, let's just say one we all we all watched happen with our own eyes, infectious diseases that I have never seen more change in two and a half years in my entire life. From the knowledge that we had in March of 2020 to the knowledge that we had yesterday, the change, the change is vast. So that is sort of a, a living, breathing example that we unfortunately had to walk through to see how things can change. Uh, so quickly, and it's really, really, really important, particularly in our nonfiction collections and in our academic libraries, that we keep our information as up to date as possible because people will believe, especially from a book that they pick up out of the library, a trusted institution. Um, so uh, there, we also, the link that we're actually sending you, we're calling it the crew manual, but actually it's the new crew manual and the new crew method. There have, and by new, we mean 10 years old. By new, we mean 2012. Um, but really uh, what they did was they sort of, they gave an update. That chart that's on page 105, that did not exist in the previous, uh, the previous iteration. Um, They've added sections like non-print material, um, bibliographies. Um, some of the sections have been more fleshed out because each one of these like Dewey sections and each one of these additional criteria and topics that we're gonna touch base on have their own section for you to read. It's not just a formula. So even though you have sort of been given a formula, there are other things to keep in consideration, which is why there's no sure-fired method even though page 105 makes it look like there is a sure-fired method. Um, and some of the additional special sections that have been added to the new crew method are reference, non-print, children's, and we're gonna hit each of those uh, individually relatively soon. So what items would you not need? We spend a lot of time talking about what to get rid of. We've essentially told you to throw away your entire libraries. That's a joke, we didn't tell you to do that um, for the sake of the recording. Um, but there are some things that you're gonna wanna keep. And that's gonna be things that are of local or historical interest. Uh, at a library that I worked at, they found like old money, um, some of those old newspapers that are in the big, the big books. Um, historical record and historical information. You're not gonna wanna just throw those items away. Those are some things that you might wanna reach out to your local historical society for. Depending on what the item is, maybe even reach out to not us, but the folks in Hartford at the Connecticut State Library. There is a museum that's up there and depending on the items, there might be something that they can do with it. There is a statewide uh, digitization project on um, digital newspapers. There might be something that can be done with things that way. So you don't wanna just throw those things out. Um, you do, but you may wanna get them out of your library. Maybe your library is not the appropriate home for them. Uh, also rare items. If you've got like a first edition Gutenberg Bible, maybe don't throw that away either. Right, like may, maybe uh, that is so rare that you know there's something else that can be done with that, right? I don't know, Library of Congress, somebody, but don't just throw it away. Take a moment and do a little bit of research and see if there's something that can be done with that. Um, materials that are out of print and never going to be reprinted, um, that there might be some value in in some other way aside from book pulping or book art, right? I mean, our libraries, especially those that are older and that have been around for a while, have sometimes become the holding grounds for a lot of things. And our libraries and the way that we need to use them now may not be the appropriate space uh, to continue to hold those items. But before just tossing them, maybe again, do a little bit of research, make a couple calls and see if something else that could be done. And also things of um, research value, which are 
typically going to be found in an academic library, not so much in school, maybe if it was sort of buried or hidden in a public library, um, old court records, right, old um, building plans or things like that, right, those are things that someone might be able to use in from a research perspective, but they're not necessarily helpful in the day to day dealings of, of a of a public or school library. All right, now we actually get to talk about how to do this, getting our hands on it. So we'll go through all of the who, what, where, when, why, how kind of things. So we'll start with when. It can be really helpful if you schedule this for yourself. So first of all, you kind of have to make it a priority and say, I'm gonna do this for an hour a week or however many hours per month, or I'm gonna do it every Wednesday morning for that hour when I'm here and the library is not open yet. But I'm gonna schedule that, right? I'm gonna put it on my calendar. I'm gonna make sure that I am making this project a priority. If I can do it when the library is closed, that's a nice time, right? Because I can get into the stacks. There's not patrons around who are gonna say, oh, librarian, let me ask you questions. I can actually focus in that quiet time on my weeding project. And it's a great hour, you know, nice, that's a nice chunk of time to do it so you don't get too overwhelmed by the volume and the, and the number of things you're doing. If you can have somebody shelf read before you weed, that's helpful, right? So you're printing out basically a shelf list of what you have in your collection, how it should be ordered on the shelves. Maybe there's a page or a shelver who just runs through first and makes sure that everything is in the correct order on the shelf. Then you can go through and weed and it's a lot easier to find things. You're not like searching around where it might've been misshelved. Maybe you also wanna do this at the same time you're doing an inventory project. So you've got that shelf list and you're double checking. Do I actually have this item on the shelf? Is it here? Is it um, missing? Where did it go? Let me hunt it down. And let me also think about uh, weeding these other items on the shelf around it. You might be able to do that together. As I mentioned, an hour is a nice amount of time to do this. So, so plan yourself in small doses. If you say, I'm gonna do this for eight hours, I'm all day, you're gonna drive yourself bonkers, right? Like him, like even, even like a couple or three hours can be a long time in the stacks. And part of the problem is that then you end up with a really full cart that you have to deal with at some point too. So if you're working in the stacks and maybe an hour, then you take it back to your office, that's a more manageable quantity that you can work your way through before you go back out into the stacks. And as Kim mentioned, the continuous review process, it should be continuous. So um, not just that you're doing it all the time, doing it kind of in a loop, you're going back and doing the whole collection, but that you're also doing this throughout the year. So don't just save it for January because you're never going to get done. You're never going to get through. Take it in those little bits, you know, a, a little bit here this week, a little bit next week, a little bit the week after throughout the year. And you can actually start to see some progress as you go. And I used to say this even before that I was the construction grant administrator, but you have to weed before you do any kind of renovation or construction project. First of all, you wanna just shrink your collection down to something more manageable. And you do not want to pay to box, move, store for who knows how long, move back, unbox and reshelve items that you don't want to keep anyway, right? So just weed ahead of time. It's going to save you a lot of time and money in the long run. And it's going to give you this beautiful collection when you reopen after your construction project. So go ahead and do that before you do anything construction wise. So let's talk about who you're here. You're probably convinced that you need to weed. Make sure that your coworkers understand that this is important too. Use those uh, concepts that we've been mentioning about collection management, the whole cycle, so they understand why and the purpose of this project. It's also great to get your Capital F friends and your board on board with this as well so that they understand this process. And remember, it's not an irresponsible disposal of taxpayers' money. It's that concept of providing the best possible collection for your community 
and a collection that your community can be proud of. So sometimes, as Kim said, that is um, terminology, right? So maybe you don't want to say weeding. Maybe you don't want to say discard. Maybe you want to say the maintenance. Maybe you want to say management. I have um, in a couple different places used other terms. I was at a, a ritzy library in Newport with, with our um, library committee. And I said, well, we want to refine the collection. And they love that, right? Refining, because they were people who had their own collections, whether it was a book collection or an art collection. And they understood the concept of making it better by being selective about what you put into your collection. So they were, were responsive to that idea of refinement. And also kind of more colloquially, I knew that there was a gardener on the committee and I said, well, you know, we, we weed these books out of our collection. We can put them into the book sale because, you know, one gardener's weed is another gardener's wildflower. And he got a chuckle out of that, which was really cute in the sense that something that's not suitable for my collection may be exactly what somebody else is looking for, for their own personal collection. So let them take your wildflower and go on and be happy in their collection. So we um, also wanna talk about working with a buddy. Kim was my buddy when I did the professional development. Sometimes you can physically work in the stacks together, but Kim was great as kind of my sounding board and my um, confirmer of decisions. And again, I, unfortunately we used her age. I was like, Kim, any book that's older than you has to be weeded from the professional development collection. And in fact, we went a lot younger than that too. <laughs> you know, I think the eighties, there were books from the seventies, books from the eighties, they all had to go and more recent ones, but a buddy can be helpful for you. Now, sometimes you get to sections that you don't know anything about, like the medical and the health sections, the legal sections. There are experts who can help you with that. The librarians at UConn Health are happy to help. And in fact, the law librarians in our state judicial system are happy to help you. I've heard one of them say that, and it's actually on their website, that they will help you with legal books in your collection. You also want to make sure that the person who is responsible for collection development and collection management in your library is making the final decisions about what to weed. So that person is really um, doing the entire cycle, right? So the, the whole maintenance issue that they're helping to figure out what comes into the library as well as what goes out. They've got the big picture. You can also develop some guidelines for your support staff and your volunteers whether you've got page shelvers and pages or volunteers who help you with, out with that, let them know uh, if they see something on the shelves that may be in poor condition or may just need to be replaced, that they can pull it off the shelf and put it somewhere. And you'll take a look at it and either decide to go ahead and discard that item or replace it or maybe mend it. So have some guidelines, disperse the workload a little bit as much as you can to the people who are already in the stacks. So then we're going to talk about all of the supplies that you will need to do this. Picture yourself now at your library, right? You have gone through your ILS and you've run a report and printed out some circulation records for whatever section you're working in. Maybe you want to just do a couple pages of the report at once. So maybe say I'm in the 600s and I've printed that out. I want to make sure I'm getting title, call number, last circulation date, total number of circs. That's the kind of criteria that I was looking at when I was weeding. The last circ date and the number of circs were crucial for me, uh, just helping me understand when was it last used and how often was it used up to that point. Sometimes if you can grab an um, accession date or a date when you added it to the ILS or added it to the collection, that may be helpful as well. So put all that on a spreadsheet and print it out. You're also going to bring your book truck because not just because we're librarians, but because it's also nice to have that surface to work on, nice flat top, nice uh, way of moving things around. Bring your crew manual with you. That thing, that link that I printed that you can also find on our lib guide. You can either print it and flip through it or have it on your laptop or your iPad with you so you can kind of scroll through and find the relevant section for your area. 
It's also helpful to have some extra note paper for little notes for yourself, a pencil and pen. You might want to um, keep track of what you're seeing. So you'll have your weeding slips with you, which we're going to see. But you might also want to make yourself a note like, oh, we're really strong in this area. Or I, I see some gaps here. I want to make a note and really bulk up our collection there. And as I mentioned, the weeding slips are super helpful right there. This is something that um, Linda Williams, who was Kim's predecessor, our children's librarian, developed when she and I, before she and I taught this workshop, before me. So these are, these go back away. But the front of the weeding slip, you'll see right here the front and the back. The front gives you the criteria for why you might want to withdraw that book. So you're just going to make a note on there why I'm withdrawing it. And on the back, you can cho choose if you want to repair, replace, or do something else with that book. And there's a little area that kind of gives you some of the, the crew criteria for certain sections. But this is a concise way of reminding yourself weeks later of why you wanted to actually delete that item. So put a slip in each book as you go along. If you've got a computer or a tablet, bring that with you. And then, wow, so I've got all my stuff on my cart. I'm in the aisle, I'm in the stacks. You need to take each book, each item off the shelf and open it. You need to flip through it and check condition, check for those nifty little edits that your patrons made that Kim mentioned, check for the taping inside, look at it and make sure that it's good enough to put back on the shelf or that it needs to come off for condition issues. Check it for publication, check your printout from your ILS for last CERC date, number of CERCs, condition, format, all of those. Again, make sure that this is a book that you actually want to have on your shelf, as opposed to one you might want to pull off and either replace or discard. As you're looking at it, think about any key information in that book that might have changed recently. So is this book still accurate and current and up to date, or do I need to pull it off and replace it? Think about whether it's included in a standard catalog, we have all of these enormous catalogs if you want to use them. I personally think it's more important to look at the number of CIRCs at your library and determine is that item actually being used by your community. You can also look at, um, in the stacks on your laptop and find it to see what other copies might be in the state or might be in your consortium. So again, if everybody has a copy of that book, and nobody's been checking out your copy, maybe you can let your copy go and borrow a copy from another library if one of your patrons actually wants to use it. There's always that option. So once you're in the stacks, you've got that book in your hand, you say, that's it, time to weed this. I'm gonna make a note on my weeding slip with what I decide, put that into the book, put the book on my cart, keep going. Once I've hit my hour or once I've got a full cart, that's it, I'm done. I'm going back to the office and I'm gonna deal with this. And make sure that you remove those items from your catalog, right? So you're actually physically marking them as no longer at your library with a stamp that says withdrawn or discarded or a line through the barcode. They're no longer in your catalog. They are no longer your property. And then you dispose of them according to whatever your policy and procedures are. And as Kim mentioned, we're gonna have a a lot of options for you, but it can be helpful to spell out what your particular procedures are for discards. And then, so sometimes you are 100% sure that someone wants this book. Maybe your, your shelves looked like the not that image from our, our slide earlier on. And you're thinking, it's not that no one wants this. It's just that they couldn't find it. We are fixing it by weeding. I'm convinced that this should not be one to let go, right? Like maybe you are just 100% sure. So one thing that you can do um, is something like the Island of Misfit books, the last chance display, whatever it is you want to call it for those titles where you're just like, no, I really, really think that this is just, that this is just an accident. Um, so what the Island of Misfit Books is or Last Chance Display, whatever it is you wanna call it, it's a section of your library. So maybe it's a table near the elevator, maybe it's a book cart that's by the circulation desk. 
and you kind of put some label on it, you know, um, you know, last chance for these books, you know, if they, if, if no one wants them, X, Y, Z, um, and you just, you put the books on there in a way where they're not buried sort of behind the titles that you are currently trying to get rid of, sort of the collection that you're still working on. And the theory is that if someone sees it and they're like, actually, this does sound really good. Like, I actually think I want to read this. They will take it. They will check it out. Um, they will take it home when it is returned in the book drop or wherever it's going to be put back on the shelf um, as with anything else. At the end of a certain time period, maybe you say three weeks, whatever book has not been taken from that shelf, like whatever, whatever book is still there, people picked it up, read the back, kind of put it back. That means they really don't want it. That means that you that unfortunately maybe you want it, and maybe once it's been deleted, you can take it home to your personal library. Um, but for those titles that you know we really think it's, it's just because they've been hidden and buried, um, you know, and and you just want to see, you want to give it one last chance. Um, that is just a method. Is it perfect? No, it's just sort of a fun thing that you can do um, along your weeding process, where where you really think that. Uh, the, the low circ number is just is just a mistake of of past um, you know non weeding past lack of collection management. Sad. <laughs> there we go. Kim had mentioned earlier about what books would you not want to get rid of. You may come across a book on your shelves that looks like it could be worth something like worth a little money or maybe that it's rare and maybe you've determined that it doesn't fit your particular collection but you might want to sell it or learn more about it there are a couple of couple of sites you can take a look at the site your old books from the rare books and manuscripts section talks you through the criteria for figuring out if a book might be valuable or rare it gives you some links to appraisers it's a nice place to start. And they have this fabulous reminder that just because something is old does not mean it's worth anything. And I think that there are probably many warehouses full of old books that would confirm this statement. Value really comes from scarcity in the sense that the demand exceeds the supply. And value comes from condition, demand, and importance of the text, not from age. So maybe you want to check some other websites like via Libre, eBre, Bookfinder to try and see, are other people listing this book for sale? What prices are they associating with it? Do we maybe want to try to sell this item or work with a consigner instead of having it on our shelves anymore? So that might be an option for you. So now we're ready to get rid of our items. Yay. We've gone through that whole process of looking at them, determining which ones we're going to weed. We have taken them out of the catalog. We've marked them. Anything that we had maybe some qualms about, we've run through the last chance display. So we are totally ready to let these things go. There are many options for disposal here, kind of four rough groups of what you can do. Maybe you want to sell it, right? So maybe you've got a book sale at your library or the town has a sale and you just want to sell it and let it go take the dollar that somebody will give you for it. Maybe there is a way of selling it online instead of in person, right? So maybe you are lucky enough to have volunteers who will list these titles on your website or on a used book dealer site and sell it and deal with the shipping for you. Awesome, go for that. My friend's group uses a consigner who is kind of a used book guy. He's got his own store. He lists things online. He takes things that are particularly valuable from the friends and sells them and gives us 50%. It's like the best deal ever. He does all the work and we get some of the money. So that's an option. You could also give your books away. So maybe you have some fiction, maybe you have some large print that would be perfect for an assisted living center or a senior center talk to them. I'm sure they'd be happy to have new material for their residents to read. You may have a prison nearby that would accept books. Be aware, obviously, that prisons have lots of rules. So you will want to talk to the people there 
ahead of time to find out what they will accept and what they won't. There may be certain content that they will or formats. I think some prisons don't accept hard covers, but will accept soft covers. So if that's an option in your area, it might work for you. You can also give it away to some international organizations. Be aware, they do not want your outdated junk. So make sure that anything you are sending internationally is still relatively current and is still useful and usable to people in other countries. This is not an appropriate way to get rid of things that really should just be thrown in the garbage, all right? Don't unload it on anybody. Another option for giving away is it's a free cart. Maybe you want to have a, a truck, book truck outside the front door of your library that has free books on it. Let people take them away. Then it is no longer your problem. That book becomes their problem. Give it away. Some other options are to recycle it in the sense that you might actually send it out for pulping, or you could turn it into a nifty book art program. Those have been really booming, and there are tons of ideas on the internet for various projects you can do with this. Makes a great make and take uh, or a video thing to do as well. And there's always the option to destroy your items, which basically means throw them away in a way that your ownership is not obvious. So I usually just put those in a black bag and put them right into the dumpster. So that includes items that have poor condition. If it's moldy or mildewed, if it stinks, if it's falling apart, if it's been edited by a patron, throw it away, right? Do not unload that item on somebody else because it literally is garbage. Just go ahead and put it in a black bag, throw it away and destroy it. Keep it out of the cycle. That book has done its job, right? It's, it's done. And then we've got a couple different slides here with more specific disposal methods. So again, these are all linked on our LibGuide. If you don't wanna write all these links down, you don't have to, it's okay, we got you covered. But there are online sellers, there are resellers, there are lots of options for giving away. The I do wanna mention the Baker and Taylor Sustainable Shelves Program that we've been using in Middletown at the Middletown Library Service Center. Kim, do you, you have a direct yeah. experience with that? You wanna talk about I that? I do, yeah. We've been using um, Baker and Taylor Sustainable Shelves Program at the Service Center for a couple months now. Um, it is definitely a team effort, like Maria mentioned before, sort of phoning a friend. Um, it is shockingly simple. I questioned this poor woman, our rep, a multitude of times because I was convinced she had to be lying and it couldn't be that easy. They will take any book um, whether it was purchased through Baker and Taylor or not. They unfortunately do not have a way to sustainably get rid of um, CDs, books on CDs. So we're just talking about print material here. And once you have gone through the weeding process, removed it from your system, um, there is a sort of web site for this, similar to if anyone has used Better World Books before, um, you scan and, and obtain some information from the book. I believe it's like barcode, author title, uh, um, not barcode, excuse me, ISBN, author title, I think quantity, which we've used for some book discussion sets that we've, that have been falling apart, you know, just sort of well loved in a good way. Um, and what they will do is they will tell you what books they can give you money for and what they cannot. Um, we call them uh, pink and green. Pink, they can give you money for, green, they cannot. Um, you separate those by the pink and the green. Going through um, their program, you can request a UPS pickup and print out the labels and UPS will pick up the books and take them away. Um, whether they're the books that they can give you money for or the books that they cannot, it doesn't matter. They will take everything, which is something that some of these other organizations won't, leaving you to figure out what to do with the books that they won't take. And the uh, way they have it set up, the way we have set it up um, is they filter the money that we would make back into our Baker and Taylor account to save us more money on books, which is also something that can be said for those folks that are really concerned about this deselection process. The money is going straight back into the book account so that the library can buy updated material. I believe there is also a way to have a check sent. We can't do that 
for logistical state reasons and complications, we just don't have the patience for. But it is a fantastic system. Um, they are really great folks. We do have that information linked. There's like a flyer that they sent us on the lip guide. Um, I highly suggest it. Our system is I go through and do the weeding and Brad, our digital content innovator and Matt, our director of LBPH and the director of uh, the Middletown Service Center go through and uh, get the items out of the system and OCLC, scan them and uh, you know get the designated pink or green, box them up and, and get them out. So uh, it's a really great method. I can pull and leave the books in a spot that we have designated. We typically do these on Fridays, the slow quiet days, for an hour or two at the end of the day when you're tired of staring at your computer. And we've been able to plow through sections um, and, and really see some of those, those funds grow and we direct them back into our digital um, our digital content collection. So highly, highly suggested. And it's been a nice alternative because we used to recommend Better World Books maybe a year or two ago as an alternative because they handled so much of the work. They would let you scan books in, they would come pick it up, they would send you boxes. And it was a nice solution for many libraries, but they didn't usually work with school libraries. And I think Sustainable Shelves will work with a school library. So it's a great option to take a look at instead of some of these other choices. Yes, so do some research. More, here's some more. Mm -hmm. Like we said, we've got a ton of info here for y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're gonna go into some of those special collections within your library, and we're going to start with children's. Um, so some of the things to consider when looking at your children's collection is, is the book still popular? Um, some of the books that, you know, held on to their popularity for quite some time, Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, are folks still taking those from your library with the same voraciousness as they once were? Some communities, the answer might still be yes, and other communities, not so much. Uh, some of the things with children's books, especially those older titles, some of those classics, to be quite honest, um, how are people portrayed in them? How are the main characters portrayed? Um, how do they portray people with disabilities, um, people of different racial or ethnic backgrounds? Um, we all have our own collection management policies. We all have certain things that we focus on and pay attention to when deciding what to bring in and what to keep. This is just something to look at. Um, it's a conversation I know we're having quite a bit, the, convert, the idea of stereotyping and classics within children's literature in particular. Um, but these are some things that really need to sit at the forefront of your mind when you're deciding what to keep in your library and what not to, especially if you pair that with the fact that it also wasn't circulating, like it also wasn't following sort of that crew um, uh, method where maybe just holding on to the book for nostalgia's sake. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily need to do that. Tying into that are classics and award winners. Do we need the first three years of like Newbery award winners? I don't know. Do we, like, do we still, do we need the first ever Nutmeg award winner because it was the first ever Nutmeg award winner as opposed to because people are still reading it, it's still relevant and it's still wanted by that age group? Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't even know what that book is. I don't even know what the first nutmeg is or the second or third, quite frankly. So this happens quite a bit in youth services. The nostalgia of something causes us to sort of play a game with our mind and come up with a reason why we might need it someday, maybe at some point could be. And we might not necessarily, right? It's just a book. It's not, you know, the solution to eternal life. It is just a book. Um, and as we sort of talked about, this happens quite a bit with children's books, particularly the picture books and early readers. Some of them that aren't, um, you know, maybe the, the binding isn't great. They will fall apart so quickly. Um, the turnover with picture books and those early readers um, can uh come in higher quantities than, you know, maybe some of those large tome nonfictions. So sometimes they will fall apart faster and sooner. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to get rid of those or replace them or whatnot. Uh, with young adult fiction, a lot of those rules are sort of the same. 
Um, one of the things that we want to consider, and I see this, I'm going to tie this into an anonymous question that came in, is um, if a YA title is over five years old, it might be time to let it go. We mentioned three to five years. Now, a question that someone asked is, would it be wise to move out of that four to five criteria specifically for fiction, considering how library usage has been affected due to the pandemic? And my response to that is, it depends. Now, for many libraries, they began curbside and outdoor things in the summer of 2020. There are some folks that have been, been running since the summer of 2020, and people have been checking out material using curbside or, you know, bringing it to someone's car. So when a library started to library, um, with regards to the pandemic, um, may, may affect that, right? Now, there are some folks that didn't do anything until maybe the summer of 2021, and the response to that is going to be a little bit different. So this is not, it's not a, a fun answer, I know, but it depends. And we also want to keep in mind that it's not just, um, the year part of the formula we're looking at, we're looking at the entire formula. So if the book is already 12 years old, which is terrifying. How I mean, like when someone says that something was, you know, 30 years ago, I'm still convinced that that's like 1999. It's not, it's not. Um, so time sneaks up on us all. So you're going to want to pay attention to when that book was purchased, when that book was published, and how many circs it had on its own, as well as that musty acronym. So we're not looking at just one part. We want to look at all of it. And we all responded differently to the pandemic because of the way our state is structured. Um, I'm so sorry if that is not helpful. Uh, feel free to send me a personal message or, or message to Maria and I if, there's, if you want to elaborate on that a bit more or into the Q&A. Um, but also, uh, will teens consider the cover old fashioned? I have dated myself, old millennial here, talking about animorphs and babysitters club and things like that. And those titles are dated. They are very, very dated. Or not titles, covers. Those covers are very dated. Um, publishers will at times re release. I know that Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys were re released with more modern covers, right? So take those things into consideration. It's not so much the story is no longer relevant, and there's no Judy Bloom. They, they released Judy Bloom over and over and over again. I still haven't read one, but that's okay. Um, so keep those things into consideration. And again, we keep talking about the fad and the popularity. I keep saying Twilight. I don't know why. I just, it's just in the front of my head at the moment. Um, and what that might mean for a, a fad, um, which I think I'm also going to tie into the, is this series still in demand? You might find that maybe you want two or three copies of the first book in a series, maybe two or three copies of the first Twilight or two or three copies of the first Harry Potter, but you don't necessarily need three copies of the rest of the series because folks kind of filter and read those. Um, you know, it's not like everyone's looking for the first book in a series at the same time. So these are things that you're going to have to decide. You're going to have to know your community and your community's long range plan. Everything that we're gonna give you and everything that we have already given you and that we're going to continue to give you during the rest of our time, you have to look at this as a forest and you can't look at it as a tree. It's really the entire picture and then decisions are made based on that, the entire picture as opposed to a singular tree, which is why there's kind of a formula, but like not really. Uh, and picture books. Um, we've kind of hit on all of this. Poor Karma Wilson. We just, we bought another one. Uh, we, we, we replace those heavily used books um, and get rid of the ones that aren't um, fads to consider, right? I mean, are kids still obsessed with Paw Patrol? I don't know. I've, I've been out of the game for three years and I feel like it's been 30. Um, if they're not, maybe get rid of some of those Paw Patrol books, right? Maybe some of those things aren't as necessary anymore. Do we still like Rainbow Magic Fairies? Someone in the chat tell me, do we still like Rainbow Magic Fairies? They were so popular at the library. I hope so. They're adorable. Um, yes. Thank you, Forrest. Um, on, on the sub base. Who's, don't even tell me. Uh, I don't know who in the sub base is reading Rainbow Magic Fairy, but I'm really excited that they are. Um, but these are things to keep in mind with all of these 
niche appearing collections, but they're not as niche, I think, as, as they are. I think we're mostly just sort of attached to them on a, on a, a personal level. Um, and then children and YA nonfiction. You're essentially going to follow the same guidelines with regards to weeding that you would use for the adult nonfiction collection. So you're still going to want to keep in mind those various um, uh, formulas throughout the, the crew method based on which part of the collection that you are in. Um, Honestly, why YA nonfiction might be a little wonky depending on how you set it up. If your YA nonfiction is made up of what you would find in adult or children's nonfiction, the bug section, the country section, then fine. Um, but some of those collections I know are things like, um, you know, uh, how to handle bullying, how to handle, you know, if you think you might have an eating disorder or 101 questions you'd never ask your parents, right? So those YA sections might look a little bit different. So you're going to want to poke through the manual um, to find those individual sections to evaluate um, how you want to handle weeding those um, because they might look very different from, you know, the 900s where it's all like countries and states and things like that. Um, but Ultimately, it's it's basically the same kind of formula and keep in mind musty. One of the things to also really take into consideration with children's collections in particular is that the, the mind, the mind of a child does not fully mature until about somewhere between like 24 and 27, right? So this child is probably going to, or teen really, is probably going to believe what they pick up. So if they pick up a book that, you know, has something completely ludicrous in it that we know is not real, they might believe it. Uh, true story, my my little sister believed that the small and was it this the large intestines was long enough to wrap around the planet twice. I do not know where she got this from, but she tried to tell all of us that this was true. It's not, it's not, but she learned it somewhere at school and believed this to be a true thing. And she was at least double digit years old. And just the 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 reasoning, the, you know, you're like, well, is it when you're a newborn? Is it when you're in your 80s? The reasoning didn't reason the way that um, you know, we we with our fully formed uh uh frontal prefrontal cortex and all that jazz. So you really, really have to pay a little bit of extra attention to some of those informational texts that are in there because they are going to believe it because it came from a, um, a an institution such as ours. People still believe that George Washington Carver invented peanut butter for the love of all that is holy. He did not. He did not. That did not happen. I didn't put a book on our shelves because it said that beautiful though it was. So really, really put some extra thought into that with regards to children's nonfiction. Okay, now we get to talk about grown-up fiction stuff. When I say fiction, I mean all of the fictional genres. So this includes romance, fantasy, SF, mystery, traditional fiction, whatever is made up these are the rules for it. Now, I just looked at the crew manual and that formula is X to musty. So no matter when it was published, if it hasn't circulated in the last couple of years, you could think about getting rid of that according to the crew manual. But it really all comes down to circulation, right? Are your patrons using that book? If not, it probably doesn't need to take up space on your shelf. So if it hasn't circulated at all in the last two to three years, you should think about weeding it. And that includes pandemic because a lot of libraries were still lending and they were still loaning to each other. Um, so I, I think that time frame is still accurate. And especially now that libraries are reopened, I've been looking at the stats, people are coming back. And there is a direct correlation between people being in your building and borrowing items. So um, you might want to give yourself a little more room. But also 
take a look at your publication date. If it's more than 10 years ago and it's not circulating, maybe you want to think about weeding that, especially if it's not a classic and it's not a perennially popular author. Obviously, if you had duplicates when a book was hot and it's no longer hot, and demand has dropped, you could think about getting rid of your duplicates. That's always handy. If a book is part of a series, you'll wanna think about that. So do you have the rest of the series? Do your other libraries in your consortium or around you or in the state have other part of those series? So if the author's still writing and still adding to the series, you probably wanna hang on to the older books because there may be interest in those. But if the series is done, the author has given up and there's been no circulation, that may be something you wanna keep, think about weeding. Likewise, if it's an author who was maybe kind of an obscure person who wrote just one thing, they're no longer still writing, maybe they haven't written in a long time, you could consider weeding those items if they have not circulated. So again, always think about circulation. Is something updated in style and setting? And this goes back to something Kim mentioned too. If a book is like old, not just old, but if it like reads old, like if it reads outdated and nobody does this anymore, it may be time to let that book go and replace it with something that's more current and updated in terms of a fictional setting. Maybe you also want to think about condition. With your fiction items, things that are in bad condition have probably actually circulated a lot. So that may be an indicator that you would want to replace it with a more modern printing of it. Or maybe it got loved to death five years ago and nobody's borrowing it anymore. So that's where your circulation and your publication date would come in handy. So that's why you need all of those criteria as you're in the stacks actually thinking about weeding. So is this a familiar genre? And this is getting back to the question that had been in the Q&A about familiarizing yourself with areas you don't have experience in. Maybe you're not a romance reader. Maybe you're not an SF reader. But I bet you have coworkers or patrons or friends or board members who are. So you can always get their feedback on great authors that you really need to keep or books that are absolutely still popular. So find some other people who can help you out with those genres and different areas of your collection. However, there are some genres or niches that are outdated, like nursing stories. Thankfully, we are all powerful, educated women, and we have moved into different positions. And nursing stories are no longer the thing that you know, they used to be in the 60s and 70s. So maybe those can come out of your collection just because they are outdated in terms of um, where we are nowadays. So uh, talk to people uh, and get some feedback on genres. Um, always take a look at other copies. So that's a factor in your decision making. What other copies are in the state? What other copies are in the consortium? So you're starting to get a sense of how you're looking at this item holistically in terms of, is my community using it? Is it circulating? Can I get another item from somewhere else in the state if I get rid of this and someone wants to read it again? So, so think about all of that. And as you're getting started, especially in fiction, it can take a little while right, to work your way through this decision process until you kind of get the hang of it. And there's always going to be something that you're not sure about. And there will always be something that you discard that someone requests a month later. So just plan on that, right? It's going to happen. It happened to Kim. It's going to happen in your, but you just get it from somewhere else, right? You're not Amazon. You're not the storage warehouse. It's okay. We will get that book for you. We're happy to get that back. So those are the concepts you'll think about with fiction. This is a fabulous article that Rebecca Vanuck put together. And then she turned it into a book, which is now in its second edition, which we purchased at the service center and we'll have in the catalog shortly. But a great article, just weeding tips for fiction. And she is looking at relevancy in the sense of, is it still being read? And does it reflect your community's needs and interests? So is it relevant to your particular area? And is it current? So is it up to date? 
always important. Is it appealing in the sense of condition and that it looks good, like it still looks nice on the shelf? She recognizes also that circulation increases after you weed because it's easier to browse. And she really talks about accessibility of finding materials. So that's a great article to take a look at, and it is linked on our LibGuide. We have a special section to talk about graphic novels and manga because they have a little bit of eccentricity to them. They overlap a lot with general fiction in the sense that your criteria really come down to circulation, condition, duplicates, whether it's actually being used. But you may also want to consider if you've got gaps in your series or if the series is uncompletable. And I realized this is a thing with graphic novels and manga that sometimes the publisher just ceases. Like the, the entire company will no longer be publishing um, or, or no longer be publishing even that series. So sometimes they just stop. Maybe you still have them. Maybe they're no longer circulating. This is a great way to think about what you want your collection to be. Again, have a graphic novel collection you're proud of. But these are also great items to share with other libraries. So if you're realizing you have gaps in your series, maybe see who has complementary gaps. Maybe you can kind of fill each other's collections in. Or maybe you can offer these to another library if you're weeding them from your particular collection, because some of them can be hard to get copies of. So take a look at your manga. Reference has its own quirks, obviously. Take a look in the crew manual as you are doing your reference section. But so many libraries have moved from print collections to using online resources. And you do need to ask while you're evaluating that collection, do you want to use that floor space for that or do you want to use it for people? Can you find that information somewhere else online or in research at CT where it may be updated on a more frequent basis and be more current, more accurate, and more available to everybody even when your library is closed? If you're not getting newer editions, maybe it's time to let that go. If you are getting new editions, keep the new one and maybe get rid of the old ones. <clears throat> it can also be helpful here to see which hard copies your patrons are actually using. So this is where it's nice to have a cart in your reference section and say, hey folks, if you take a reference book off the shelf, please put it back on the reshelf cart so that we can make sure it gets back to the right place. But Maybe you're also getting an in-house count or you're somehow keeping track of the books that people are actually using in hard copy as things that you might want to save in the long run. Check your crew manual. Um, they have guidance on certain materials, certain subjects, that kind of thing. Oh, and here's an idea that I wanted to mention. If you're transferring items out of reference into your circulating collection, that's an option. Maybe you want to have another display. So this display could be, hey, everybody now available to take home. And people who love birding books might be thrilled that Birds of North America is moving from reference to circulating and be happy to check that item out. So that gives you an opportunity to move something into circulation where you might get some usage stats on it that will help you decide in three to five years whether or not you're ready to let that item go. So that's reference. So obviously you have other formats in your library. Those can be tricky, but it's gonna come down to circulation. So you might want to think, is the format popular for you and your patrons in your area? I know that there are some libraries in the state that are still lending VHS because their patrons enjoy that format and it's still popular with those patrons. Other libraries may want to update to new formats. So get that same movie or that same audiobook in a more current format instead. That's an option. What, while you're thinking about that item that's actually in your hands, take a look at condition. Is it playable? Is it listenable? Or do you need to let it go for condition issues? Circulation is important. Has it circulated? If it's not, 
maybe it's time to let that go into the book sale or let that go somewhere else onto the free cart so that you can make st space on your shelf for a new title. In some cases, you might have to listen to that thing or watch that thing in order to make a decision. Sometimes you might watch it or listen to it and say, holy goodness, this is so outdated. I just need to throw this away. Um, it's time for it to go. It's been on the shelf for 20 years and it is no longer good information. You can also think for yourself, if you get rid of it, could you get a copy from somewhere else if necessary? Entirely probable, possible. If somebody really wanted it, maybe you could even purchase a copy for them. But your primary decision-making factors here are whether it's getting used, so whether it's circulating, how popular it is, and the condition or the wear and tear on it. Also take a look at your crew manual for some advice on specific formats with that. Awesome. And um, basically we, we have a, a plethora of resources here. Um, so, and we've checked these links and they are all set and good to go and they are all on the LibGuides, but we've got, um, you know, articles and information from uh, things like ALA, um, Scribed, I, I say Scribed, I know someone who says Scribed, I don't know. Um, we also have some more information uh, from OCLC with regards to weeding um, information from library journal um, and the like. We also uh, found just sort of like a cute infographic that is um, kind of school specific uh, that just just weed it the library uh, library girls tips for keeping your collection and then um, it breaks down into the acronym FRESH. Um, so just some more information, different language to talk about the weeding process with different groups of people. We also have a lot of online courses that are typically um, on demand. So you can go through them whenever you want to. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I am a huge Web Junction fan. I love going in there and finding workshops. Typically there are toolkits, uh, handouts, um, a plethora of material. You can set up a free Web Junction uh, account and it will hold and track all of the Web Junction courses that you've gone through. Um, another one from this page that I just want to highlight is Niche Academy. For any Anyone who doesn't know, the Connecticut State Library has purchased um, access to Niche Academy for state residents, essentially. And there are not only weeding, but collection development, collection management, diversity audit, all of that information um, is in Niche Academy and it is on demand. So you can do it during your free period if you're working in a school during some downtime, if you have um, off desk time, if you're in a public or academic library, um, we've already bought it. You just make a free account and they'll remember what courses you've taken. If you leave in the middle to go back and do desk duty, it'll remember where you were and drop you back off where you were. So um, this hyperlink uh, to Niche Academy here uh, will take you directly to the Connecticut State Library one so that you can access uh, every uh, all the stuff in there for, for free at no cost to you. We've got some additional reading. I've discovered on Friday that there are some people that don't know that the, that the Middletown Library Service Center lends professional development material. I had no idea that people still didn't know that. So the Middletown Library Service Center lends professional development material. We get that material to you through the deliver it system, like Maria broke down earlier in the workshop today. Um, you'll see we've got a plethora of weeding specific material here, and we have just recently purchased and received some material. So there's going to be some updated information that'll be available to y'all soon. And basically, we just have a cute little infographic to sum up what we've gone through today before we show you a video walking you through using the weeding slip. Um, and basically, it's just the life cycle of a book. If you do nothing but print this page and just like hand it to the nearest person who wants to know why you are doing this, um, this has the short and sweet of all of it. 
that the life cycle of a book is acquisitions, cataloging, processing, shelving, circulating, and weeding. We have to let things go in order to bring new things in. And I have to say about that graphic, I stole it off the internet from this fabulous creator. And I'm glad I did because I can't find it again. Like that blog is no longer there. So it is on our lib guide just because I thought it was such an eye-catching uh, way of presenting that information. So if you ever see Farouz out in the world somewhere, let her know that we love it. <laughs> and I hope that she finds other people who will enjoy her graphic as well. Absolutely. So we do, and I just also want to say out loud, we do see that some questions have come in and we will get those. And as you think of other questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, however, that being said, if we were doing this in person, it would actually be a three hour workshop and a large chunk of it would be us sending you into the stacks, um, to use the weeding slips that we showed you, um, to identify books that you thought should be weeded using the weeding slip to sort of explain the how and why. Because we are virtual, which does provide greater access to people to attend these workshops that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been able to, there is a little video um that I'm going to open and somewhere and share so give me just one second to change to a new share let me also make sure that we are going to have the sound mm -hmm. Maria if you can just give me a thumbs up when I hit play to let me know you can hear it I appreciate it Hi everyone, this is Kim, um, your Children and Young Adult Library Consultant, and I'm here um, to record a short video on um, examples of books that you might want to read from your collection and how to use the weeding slips. So I'm going to turn my camera around here. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you are um, the weeding slips. This is the back and this is the front. Um, so you'll see on this weeding slip, the acronym that we probably talked about in the webinar already, um, MUSTI. So this gives you kind of the outline of what you're looking for in a book that would require you to weed it, um, or that would put it up for weeding consideration. So we've got M for misleading, U for ugly, S superseded, T trivial, I irrelevant and E elsewhere. So the first book that I would like to um, show you is this one, um, Inventions. So we can already look um, at the cover of this book and see that it's possible that um, it's a book that's a little older. Um, the cover probably isn't going to be as interesting to um, the kids or teens that may come into our library looking for it. Let's open this book and check the publication date. So we'll see that this book was published in 2003, so well over 10 years ago. Um, so let us come over here and take a look at our reading slip. So at first glance, I would categorize this as um, M, misleading, outdated, or obsolete, um, and possibly also S, superseded. I am almost positive that there is a newer edition of, if not this exact book, Inventions, than a book that is fairly similar to it. So we would cross off M. Um, outdated or obsolete, and possibly even S superseded if you have an additional copy of this book or something that's really comparable. And then we're going to take it to the back and we decide is this a book that we want to repair, repair or is this a book that we want to replace. So there's nothing really structurally wrong with it. Um, the spine is okay. Um, none of the pages are ripped or watermarked. So this is just something that we would just want to go ahead and replace. Um, so then you decide here with something else on this subject with the newer edition of the same book. So maybe with something else on this subject. And then you could write some notes in here if you wanted to. 
one of the things that makes this particular meeting slip incredibly helpful is that there's this little key on the back here with publication dates um, so that you can kind of compare what the call number of the book is if it's nonfiction, and then you can kind of decide is it three years old is it 10 years old um, and so on and so forth and we've already decided this book is over 10 years old it it's time so what you would do if you were reading a giant section is you would pop this slip here in the book and then you would pop it on a book cart so that way when you finally do get around to pulling these books from the system you'll remember why it was you chose, chose to read this particular book so let's take a look at another one so here we have two copies of the same uh, cultures of the world book on Ghana so let's go ahead and open this to see when this book was published and this book was published in 1999 um, that is quite some time ago so we also um, happen to have a newer edition of Ghana um, the same cultures of the world series and let's see when this book was published this book was published in 2019 significantly better than 1999 you don't have to read both of these books to know that there is probably newer and more accurate information in the 2019 um, cultures of the world Ghana book than in the 1999 one so let's go right on back to our reading slips here and this is absolutely superseded by a newer edition um, and if you even wanted to jot a little note down saying that this book was published in 1999 um, then you could do that now on the back here um, if you wanted to use the note section then you could put something along the lines of own new edition 2019 again um, we fill out these slips and we add these notes because odds are you can read um, the books say you know one day you isolate some time to go ahead and do that but you might not get to actually pull the book from the system for one or two weeks and it's possible that maybe you aren't the one that pulls the books from the system maybe it's somebody in your tech services department putting these reading slips in here lets them know um, what your thought process was why you're choosing to read the books um, so that they kind of are on the same page as you are so the last book that I'm going to pull for example is um, Myths and Civilization of Ancient Egypt. So now this book, um, it might be hard to tell in this video, but see these, uh, these pages here. It looks like there's a little bit of water damage that happened with this book. We also have um, sort of some issues happening here in the spine at the top and at the bottom. So this book's had quite a bit of use. Um, so when looking at the reading slip, I might in fact just mark this book um, as ugly. It, it just is. Um, and what with regards to ancient Egypt, um, I'm not sure about your collections at your own libraries, but typically we have a lot of books on ancient Egypt. So for example, um, I've got this book here, Egyptian Towns. It's newer, it's more modern, it's something that's going to be a bit more visually appealing voices of ancient egypt also a newer um slightly more modern book as well as crafts of um the ancient world crafts and cultures of the ancient egyptians um so this book here is supposed to um give readers information on civilization and here i've just pulled three books one of which is from national geographic that are going to have the same information if not um more and then also something that we always want to do when we're considering books for deletion is take a look at the copyright date and this book is from 1998 so um and also actually when i opened it i, I noticed that the page is here see how it's a bit warped so there's actually probably some a good amount of water damage uh, with this book as well and because i know that not only do i have these three books on ancient egypt there are a plethora more we can easily choose to let this one go 
let's go ahead and finish marking this up. Um, so it's worn beyond repair because there's nothing that we can do about the water damage. Um, and then um, pictures or format outdated. You know what, I'm not sure if the pictures and format are outdated, but the book is definitely old. Like it's, it's, it's old. We can, wow, there's actually a lot of water damage here. I can um, see and feel as I'm trying to bend and turn the page. So um, while the pictures um, and or format might not necessarily be outdated, it's definitely worked. And what I might wanna do here um, is write water damage. You know, and maybe add your initials to these too if there are multiple people in departments doing meetings, just so that if anyone wanted to contact you and kind of ask you what's going on, they'll know who it is. And I'm going to take this book and I'm also going to put it right here on my book cart. And this is the basic process for, um, you know, going through and weeding your materials and using the weeding slips. I hope this video was helpful um, and we'll talk to you soon. And by talk to you soon, what I meant when I was just talking was we'll talk to you now. Oh, I don't know why I stopped sharing. I'm sorry, folks. Um, so. And one of the things I noticed in that video, the, the first Ghana book that you showed that was from 1999 looked like it was in great shape, right? And mm -hmm. so you might pull that off the shelf and be like, oh, I'm not going to weed this. This is in perfect condition. But that's why the other in bits of information are so important. You do need to know the publication date. You do need to know circulation. You do need to know what other items you have on that subject so that you can make those informed decisions like Kim did. Maybe that book is in perfect condition because nobody's checked it out in 24 years and it's really time to let it go and replace it with a newer one. So, so don't let condition fool you into keeping something on your shelf that may be outdated and inaccurate. And something to be said, um, sort of tying into a question that someone asked about what do you do with books that you're not familiar with? I personally don't know anything about Ghana, nothing. Someone could walk up to me and tell me that everyone in Ghana has like a pet camel. And I'd be like, oh, okay. I mean, it doesn't sound right, but I, that, that's a weird thing to lie about, right? And that might be something that I believe. If I were to flip through that book on, of Ghana from 1999, I would have no idea if any of that information was outdated or was just wrong when it was printed or if, or if something new had been learned or something culturally had changed. I have absolutely no idea um, because that's not something that I'm, that's not a country that I'm familiar with. Um, so though, yes, again, don't miss the forest for the trees um, mm -hmm. is ultimately what this all boils down to. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great way to also mention getting help maybe from other people if you're working in a school maybe you talk to those departments who may teach world history or geography who can give you some feedback on those books so there's going to be somebody who knows that subject who can help you out with those absolutely and um that's basically our presentation, uh, Weeded and Reap. And we are here to collect, uh, take some questions. There was, there was one that was asked in the chat twice. Um, and I don't think, and this is going to be a situation where we're not going to have an answer for you. What percentage of the book budget do you recommend setting aside for replacing slash updating items? Um, I do not think we're going to have a percentage, especially because, and this is one of the things about Connecticut, right? We all sort of operate and function independently. So there might be some people with relatively up-to-date collections, like the library that Maria gave an example of, um, where they did a big weed and now their circulation is through the roof. Um, the percentage of the budget that they may need to set aside for replacement might be a smaller percentage of their budget than um, maybe an older library that hasn't done a lot of weeding, that's got a lot of stuff that it needs to update, right, in the various um, sections of Dewey. So, uh, or replace, right, within their picture book collection. I, I don't have an answer. I don't. Um, I would suggest maybe taking some of that stuff into consideration, maybe doing a spot check of your shelves um, and seeing how many of the items look like they're in need of either a new copy of the same book or um, 
updated versions that need to be purchased. It's really hard to say. What do you think, Maria? Yeah, I don't know that there's a formula for that. You know, like you said, there's there's a not really a formula. There is, but it isn't. So do your best, save a little bit, maybe start with what you can for replenishing items and build on it next year if you need to. But you may just have to learn that knowledge over a few years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with regards to, to your collection. Um, and I would suggest uh, for anyone who has any questions about the disposal methods, um, we know the disposal methods that we have used either currently in the Connecticut State Library or um, in previous libraries that we've worked where we've had disposal methods. Um, if we're talking specifically about something like school libraries, uh, a place to reach out to might be American Friends of Kenya. But again, something to keep track of that Bina mentioned in the chat um, was please be cognizant of the books that you are donating. Bina mentioned that after Katrina, people sent tons of books that were yuck, that were yuck, that, that are not books that we would be proud to, to have shared with someone else. Um, so I would reach out to Sustainable Shelves. Like I said, it, it, uh, that's something that we are, that we have used and, and is working really well for us. I've got two screens. That's why I'm looking this way, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, if anyone in the chat knows of any book, um, book dispersal methods uh, specifically for school libraries or specifically for academic libraries, uh, please share that with us in the chat. Do we have any other questions? I'm scrolling to make sure I didn't miss anything. I believe we have um, responded to everything that was sent um, via Q and A. Unfortunately, not always with an exact answer. I know um, as library folk who tend to be looking for an exact answer, that can be frustrating. It's just the reality. It's just that this is what happens when you have 169 vastly different communities squished into one state. And and that's an, again an, an important point. You know, worth reiterating as we're here at the end. Do what's best for your community. Give them the best collection for your community. It's going to come down to what your community is using, what they're borrowing, and what they're interested in. And that takes a little bit of time and knowledge to develop, but it's worth doing. Westport, Woodstock, and Washington, Connecticut all start with W. And that's probably about all they have in common, right? I mean. Unfortunately, we can't give one answer that's going to work for all 190 public libraries, and I don't even know how many schools there are, and I don't know how many, I just don't know, hundreds. Yeah, yep. All right, well, if there are no other questions, yeah. Uh, like we said, these slides are already up on the LibGuides. Please take a moment to fill out the evaluation. Help us help you. I obsessively look at the evaluation responses. Um, maybe I should stop doing it as excessively as I, as I do, but I do it because I want to make sure that we're serving you to the best of your capacity and providing you with what it is that you actually want to know and not what we think you want to know. Mm -hmm. um, so... And we have, in fact, added things to this presentation based on feedback we got from people. So let us know if there's something we missed that yeah. we can include for the future. Yeah, yeah. Graphic novel, novel and manga section didn't exist. So, yeah. cool. All right, folks. All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we are here if you need us. Most of y'all know where to find us at this point. Um, and uh, happy weeding. Bye, everybody.